So hello everyone. Um, we are starting the session. It's now eight o'clock. I'd like to very, very warmly welcome all of you. This is a very exciting moment for us because it's the first, you know, part of our new lecture series at the Center for Historic Houses. I'm immensely grateful for all of these invisible hands behind the scenes, my interns at the center, who've done um, a lot of work to promote the event, to do research for the event, um, and to work for the Center for Historic Houses. It's also wonderful to have so many visitors from all over India and from many parts of the world, from Austria, from um, Italy, from France, from the UK, from the United States, from Malaysia, from Japan, um, and other places that I can't remember at the moment. And I'd like to really ensure that this is a live event. And so because we will record it, but you know, I think we should have this feeling of really being connected with the whole world. So if you would like to take this opportunity um, um, to use the chat function um, to, um, you know, send a greeting from where you are or something, you know, who you are, this would be really nice. And if you have a question, um, you can type it into the chat um, as well, you know, and we really want to use this opportunity uh, to interact with, um, with us um, and just write a cue in front of the question, um, because we have a number of, um, you know, um, attendees, um, so that it's easier for the moderators to see the question uh, rather than the comments. Um, right. So um, I'd like to introduce myself, and I have been so busy with the Center for Historic Houses that I actually forgot to include my name as a moderator. So my name is Esther Schmidt. A lot of people know me as Mimi for the simple fact that my daughter, when she learned to speak, couldn't pronounce mummy, and she said Mimi. So this is really where my nickname comes from. Um, and I'll just now uh, tell you a little bit about um, uh, the Center for, Hist for Historic Houses um, in India, which is a newly founded institution um, only last year. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, um, which is part of the whole journey of heritage and um, related to the topic. And then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the um, yes, inspiration for the title of this lecture series. So I'll just switch to um, screen share and to the PowerPoint presentation that I should hopefully find. So. Right. Resilience. Historic houses of India and their custodians. So we have a, a number of really important words there and I'll talk about this in a minute, namely resilience, um, um, which was inspired by E.O. Wilson and um, uh, books that we were reading um, as students when I was a student um, at Oxford. And uh, the role of custodian rather than owner. Uh, which really should imply this idea of, of responsibility uh, rather than ownership and being really part of you know the, the whole flow of time looking at the people who were before us and the people who will come after us. So I'll start with um, a surprise because the whole idea of the lecture series is that we want to um, you know unravel the hidden histories behind these buildings and they are full of surprises and this is one and you might think what does it have to do with India? Now, let's have a look. Thank you. 
thank you. So um, this is um, basically music from the 1920s, 1930s, and um, uh, the, the band will actually join us on a very special day that we are organizing for the first time in India, Palace Day, on the 19th of July, which was organized by the European uh, Royal Residences, starting with Versailles. And uh, it quickly took on, and you know, last year about 60 million uh, people were viewing it on social media and so it's basically the first time uh, that we are initiating um, Palace Day with the Indian palaces joining and so this is uh, going to be very exciting and the music we heard um, was actually inspired by a princess from uh, Kapotala and you know it's also an example of how the small locality in India is connected with the whole world and that cultural heritage is all connected, and that ideas and designs, they travel through the world. So this is something that we take very seriously and strongly uh, look at for, as far as our research is concerned. And, and you know, it's the topic of East meets West in architecture and design. So the Center for Historic Houses um, was started last year, and we had um, a wonderful um, international conference on water and heritage, which is one of our main research areas. So you see, when we look at um, um, historic residences in India, it's a topic that is closely linked with uh, development strategies. So for instance, here you see a, a picture of a beautiful lake palace. Although this was built you know, by um, a Maharaja, it was really used for everyone. Because you'll find that these um, lake palaces are usually in desert states. Uh, and they were basically artificial lakes and um, you know, functioned as water reservoirs. So uh, it's a combination between abundance, luxury, but also necessity. And we, uh, the university is currently involved in a number of uh, development strategies to help the local villages and we are rejuvenating uh, um, traditional water bodies. And um, this is then connected also with you know, sewage uh, treatment and, and many other things. So this is one of the um, um, aspects that we highlight. And this is kind of unique for India, if you look at the history of historic houses. But it's something that we also um, you know, um, suggest as a, a business idea to link historic houses with social entrepreneurship. And we are organizing a, um, a workshop in um, September with a number of the uh, European historic houses and palaces from France and Italy, the UK, uh, together with um, various institutions and heritage organizations to come up with a strategy um, um, that we call um, historic houses beyond tourism um, in response to the current scenario of COVID-19. Um, and um, so we are developing business plans that do not depend on visitors. So this is a little bit about the center. We have, um, we don't have very much time, but um, basically uh, we are an organization. We have three main stakeholders. One is the owners of historic houses. One is uh, the group of heritage experts. And the third group is the public or heritage enthusiasts. So we basically work and collaborate with all of them. We create um, uh, various kind of instruments for all of these groups that ranges from uh, lectures, uh, heritage interpretation schemes to improve visitor improvement um, uh, experience um, uh, to concrete business plans um, and events. And this is a little bit about myself and how I ended up actually doing what I'm doing because um, you know the career of heritage as you all know is not a kind of linear development moment. Um, it, um, it is something that um, um, inquires a lot of entrepreneurial initiative. So I grew up in a small uh, German village that you can see here. And um, um, the Brothers Grimm were born not far from where I grew up. And this is basically the landscape um, of fairy tales and the setting of fairy tales. And you see that every two to three kilometers, there was a historic house of importance, such as the fortress, or what you see um, above here is actually an 18th century workshop of the most famous um, um, cabinet maker in 18th century Europe. It's uh, the Röntgen family. And this is very um, you know, closely linked to the Indian context because we find that somewhere in the middle of nowhere, this person could, because of his own initiative, be linked to the whole world. And I give you an example of this. Here you see the Brothers Grimm, and you see um, a, new, um, a bureau that was designed by the Röntgen family and um, you know, recently um, produced fairy tales in that particular fortress that I showed you and uh, Röntgen. So this is something of the State Hermitage Museum. I'll just show a, a tiny little bit to see how this tiny village could be connected uh, even with the court and 
in, in St. Petersburg. In the State Hermitage, there's a hall that contains a collection of great furniture masterpieces. Among them is a unique bureau decorated with a figure of the god Apollo as an allegory of science. Who was the craftsman who created this and other unique examples of applied art? David Röntgen was born at Herrenhag near Frankfurt am Main in 1743. Into the family of the cabinet maker. And this is basically, um, you know, the, uh, the little house that I showed you earlier. This is the whole ensemble and only two of them are left, but there are still people there who work as cabinet makers. They have a very exciting program, namely to, tra uh, to train unemployed youth in conservation techniques, and then they find jobs um, in through historic buildings. And this is something that I find very exciting to combine entrepreneurship with historic houses. And these are some of the beautiful historic houses where I lived um, because of my career from um, you know, the United States where I was a curator um, um, uh, J.P. Morgan collection of um, um, European decorative arts to a beautiful uh, Baroque palace in, in, in Vienna. And then I finally moved to India and this is where the journey started and I really, I, I kind of you know, started uh, from a point of of humility because when you come somewhere new you there's just so much you have to learn but you also bring something to the table my own experience and one of it was um, you know the heritage sector that I got to know when I was a student and a tutor at, at Oxford it's uh, fantastic in the UK and you find that in most Western countries you have um, associations that are kind of lobbies behind um, historic houses and nothing uh, nothing similar existed in India so I really felt there was a need and um, there was a need to have a kind of also um, an intermediator in a way between the um, university and between the uh, public and the, and the owners of historic houses. And um, so this is, you know, I arrived in Delhi and uh, the next morning I already went to Rajasthan and I visited and stayed in some of these beautiful historic houses. And it's kind of similar to what I experienced um, as a child. I saw these beautiful houses, but I didn't know their history. I got to know that much, much later. And the whole series, the lecture series that I'm proposing today is really about looking behind the scenes, getting an idea and un unraveling the, the hidden histories, finding out about the people, how they lived, their motivation, how they contributed to the world. And uh, this is Delhi. Um, this is also another research area of ours, namely Rashtra Pati Bhavan, its collection of interiors and furniture and um, the architect, um, uh, Sir Edwin Lutyens. The center is planning a series of five lectures on, on, on Sir Edwin Lutyens uh, this year. And here you um, see him. Some people have called him the greatest architect since Ren. And um, these are the princely palaces in Delhi. And uh, this is the inspiration for my lecture. Um, E.O. Wilson, who um, had um, an accident when he was a child, um, uh, he got nearly blind in his eye. He could only focus on tiny things, so he started studying ants. And he compared the behavior of ants with the idea of collaboration as well as, you know, um, bias, you know, both uh, to human beings. And uh, um, the word has ever since been used in, you know, a number of contexts, including um, resilience in, in, in building sciences, for example. And I think, you know, given the current scenario of the coronavirus and um, given the incredible context of historic buildings in India, resilience is just, you know, one of the best terms that comes to mind. Um, I also have this, you know, uh, poem by Rudyard Kipling um, from The Elephant's Child. And these are the kind of questions I'd like to uh, keep in mind while we are listening uh, to all the various talks, uh, starting with the one today from Bab Naga. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. I send them over land and sea. I send them east and west. But after they have worked for me, I give them all a rest. And so the question is really, what do we do with historic buildings? How are they used today? 
And how can a difficult history or complicated history in the past be reinterpreted and adapted to a new and kind of a modern contemporary use? I use it um, because um, currently there are discussions about changing the central vista in Delhi. And I give some examples of, let's say, the, the White House, which is a historic building, but of course still being used and adapted to contemporary circumstances. And a great example, I think, is the Reichstag which, with its horrible history um, you know, uh, of national socialism, but the kind of brilliant solution of uh, Sir Norman Foster's uh, glass dome, which makes uh, uh, democracy transparent and the people can actually watch. And you know, I like this image of people having a picnic and you know, being so close to, um, in, to the Reichstag. Um, so this is uh, one example of some of the uh, people who will be giving other talks in the future. And their incredible story associated with the house and their different motivations from Aman Nath, who uh, founded Nimrana. Um, and he, um, I think about four, between 40 and 50 uh, wonderful historic buildings belong to it from palaces to forts and other historic buildings. He is someone who simply continues building. He doesn't give up when he sees um, you know, a ruin. And I find that extremely fascinating. And uh, so I would like to give him a forum um, to talk about um, this particular journey. And then we have someone like the Maharaja of Dundlut, who's done an incredible work with Francesca Kelly on um, you know, preserving, looking after, and, and bringing Mavari horses into the foreground. So all of these people have a kind of certain passion and uh, something that drives them in life, which is connected to the building, into the context, uh, to the larger community. So the question is really, how do these, build, how do these people survive? Why do they not give up? when others give up. I mean, look at this image, for instance, you know, of, you know, of, of a building in this situation. Most people would give up, but some people don't. For instance, this is what they actually made out of it. And this, I think, I would like to give these people a voice. And I would like to use this um, opportunity of the lecture series to document uh, what um, is happening um, to these uh, buildings and to share this with the larger community. And so this is basically the idea. Although suffering and challenge demoralize some human beings, others cope and construct instead. Rather than grinding to a halt, certain people hurdle the obstacles or creatively maneuver around them. They even make something positive out of the negative situation. In the face of crisis, they do not only survive, but they also thrive. Resilience, capacities involve coping well with difficulty, actively resisting destructive pressures and rebuilding positively after adversity. So I really, especially in the, you know, in the current situation of the coronavirus and um, the great polarities um, in society that we are witnessing, I'd like to use these historic buildings and their custodians um, to be an inspiration for all of us. And now I'm coming to um, our first speaker, and it's a great honor to welcome Brijeshwari. And we actually met by chance, if there is such a thing as chance, because we both love dogs very much. And my puppy was, uh, <laughs> she, he, he really liked Brijeshwari. He was running over to her. And then she wanted to show the puppy to her mother. And surprise, surprise, I had already, we had already met before. So it was a continuous series of surprises. And uh, Brijeshwari is very special because she combines both, you know, uh, someone who has grown up in a historic house and someone who is a heritage expert. She, was, um, she has a BA in uh, a history of art and um, in archaeology from Nottingham and uh, she did an MA in, in international Her heritage management from Durham. And this is very special as well because I think the focus of research has not been on port cities so much, especially not Bhavnagar. And um, so this is the map. So just we have an idea of where we are. It's an extremely interesting context that we are today talking about the context of um, an old port city. And now I'd like to hand it over to Brijeshwari and thank you very much. And this is something we also really want to support women leadership and heritage. And so um, you know, having such a young um, you know, person here to uh, give the first lecture of this series. Thank you very much, Brijeshwari. Hello everyone. Um, thank you, Mimi, for that warm introduction. And um, as um, you highlighted, I have done my um, undergrad in archaeology and history of art, following which I did my master's from Dalhem in heritage management. Um, but 
I have been exposed to cultural heritage as a whole ever since I have been a little child, I think. So the interest in actually studying, the interest in actually studying the topic and um, stuff came from my mother who sort of influenced me to go down this line. And I saw the way she protected and saved the heritage of our ancestors. And I found it very interesting to actually then have um, a more professional background in the subject so that I could lend a hand and contribute to the family ancestry. And uh, with that, I will um, start my tour of Nilamba Palace. Uh, given that we are all in um, a global pandemic right now, I think uh, everyone is making the most of the digital and trying to showcase and witness what they can see. And uh, in a time where traveling is restricted, I hope and pray that uh, I can um, showcase and do a good job of um, taking you down memory lane at Nilambak Palace. So um, just a second, I will just uh, share my screen here. Um, So we begin by the title that I chose was if stones could speak, um, looking back, moving forward for the simple reason that every time I walk um, in my ancestral home, I always wonder what stories and what the stones have witnessed having been here for much, much longer than most of us. And so we begin with looking back. Bhavnagar uh, was founded in 1723 by uh, one of my forefathers, Maharaja Bhav Singh Ji of Bhavnagar. And the reason for choosing Bhavnagar as a location was because of its proximity to the sea. This acted as a natural fortification for the kingdom but it was also a great way to start maritime trade in uh, Bhavnagar. And uh, the port continues to hold significance in the city, given that Alang being the, one of the largest shipbreaking yards in the world. And we still have uh, people coming here just uh, to work at Alang. A lot of locals get their livelihood from Alang as well. So uh, this continues to be a significant part of Bhavnagar's present as well. And Nilamba Palace, here we have the front view of the property. Uh, it stands resilient still, and it's located in the heart of the developing city. So we aren't really cut off in um, some hill or cliff or mountain, but we are in the heart. Um, of the city and it was commissioned in 1879 and uh, built by the engineer Richard Proctor Sims. He was a, a British engineer having German roots and he continued to be the uh, Bhavnagar state engineer during the uh, princely states. He continued to be the engineer for more than two decades. I think it was approximately 25 years that he served as the state engineer. And he then brought in another German architect who helped him with the design aspect of um, Nilambar. And um, uh, Sims was, uh, Richard Proctor Sims has been uh, credited for a lot of the historic structures in the city. And um, so much so that we have a beautiful structure built in memory of him, a statue of him in the heart of the uh, market area of Bhavnagar now and um, the structure is built using Rajula stone. Rajula is um, a small area in Bhav not so far from Bhavnagar and um, the structure is built using Rajula and lime mortar and the ceilings of 
uh, Niambag uh, have um, wooden and iron fittings. The area that we now see has obviously shrunk with time. At one point, Nilambag was uh, 2.4 square miles large. The area that encompassed um, the property was 2.4 square miles large. And of course, post-independence with development, uh, we have been restricted to a small part now. And now, as we make our way into the property, uh, my father, um, Maharaja Vijayarad Singh, who uh, was the last to really live here from all of us and grew up at Nilambag will give a short introduction to what we now call as the Nilambag Palace Lobby. Hello, Namaste. This is Vijayarat Singh Goel. And I'll give you a brief history about the Silambar Palace. It was built in 1879 by my great-grand-grandfather, who is right over here. That's Maharaja Tatta Singh Ji. Maharaja Tatta Singh Ji was uh, an art connoisseur who was often seen um, in the Bombay Art Society exhibitions, actually. And he was known for distributing prizes and scholarships to budding talent. Being a patron of art and architecture, several eminent structures in the city have actually been commissioned during his reign as the Maharaja. He was also the one responsible for sorry, inviting artists such as Raja Ravi Varma and uh, John Griffith in the late 1800s to uh, Bhavnagar. And it was built as a residence for the Yudhra, then Yudhraj, who is my great grandfather, Maharaja Pao Singh Ji, who is pictured over there. That is my great grandmother, Maharaja Purva, who had introduced uh, girl education in the early 1900s. Uh, here we have a photograph in the lobby of uh, Nilamba Palace of uh, Maharani Nanpurba Sahib. And um, as my father stated, uh, she had introduced girl education um, in the city. She started a school called Maharani Nanpurba Kshatriya Kanya Vidyale, which continues to be run um, under my mother now. And uh, she has introduced an English um, medium uh, as well as a college and the school was founded in 1917. She was an advocate of feminism as we will see in the next picture and she was also the one who abolished the parda system. She was uh, the recipient of the highest imperial award in the British Empire for women uh, known as the crown of India. The outfit that we can see uh, her wearing it's um, the traditional outfit that the women in Bhavnagar and this region of Kathawar wore. Uh, it's um, a jacket, it's not exactly a blouse, it's a jacket with a tissue sari and uh, tissue is um, this delicate sari that continues to be a customary outfit uh, of the area. The following image now we see um, Marani Nankorba Saib again and you can see the advocate for feminism there with her driving the car at um, this time in Bhavnagar and we have the governor of Mumbai and other dignitaries sitting uh, behind her in the car. That's my grandfather, Mr. Krishna Kumar Singh, one of the first two rulers who had over the state with independent India. Here we can see a picture of the uh, last ruling Maharaja of Bhavnagar, Maharaja Krishna Kumar Singh Ji. As my father highlighted, he was the first to give up his kingdom to democratic India. He, here we can see him wearing the traditional Angarkha, an outfit that was worn by the men of all statures at the time. Uh, he was the first to give up his kingdom, following which he was the, following which he was the governor for Madras. 
and uh, during his time in madras he received a lot of gifts in the form of artifacts and artworks and these continue to be housed in nilamba palace and are available for the viewer to see we have actually been under uh, the process of planning a museum in his memory over the past few months so we are hoping that that is something that can be successfully completed uh, by the time the pandemic is over and that's when we father who started to sell in 1984 now if you see this part this is the good work which was brought from Burma during the early 1900s by Maharaja Rao Singhji, my great grandfather. And while this was the residence till 1984, from 1979, it underwent a lot of changes, a lot of construction changes. For example, there used to be a tower right above the place where we were standing, which was demolished and a room was added there. And this part where we are standing, that used to be a lobby to meet VIPs and dignitaries. The most famous among them being Aga Khan, who visited this place many, many times. Here we can uh, see an image that has been displayed at the lobby of uh, Nilambag. So the lobby where um, my father is speaking, we have uh, showcased photographs of dignitaries that visited the palace as well as family members. So um, people coming to the palace get an idea of the past as well as uh, the present um, day use of the palace. And uh, here we can see Aga Khan, the Aga Khan. And we continue to host followers from the Aga Khan Trust even uh, till date. This photograph is from 1969. Here we can see um, a traditional patara. So to give um, the viewer, um, to give people visiting Nilambar Palace a good sense of the combination of British and Indian art and architecture, we have these two pataras that have been uh, put on both corners of the lobby. So the first impression that when one enters, you get an idea of the colonial influence as well as the traditional craft of the area. Pataras uh, were basically, the tradition of a patara was to gift a patara to the daughter at the auspicious time for a, during her wedding. And uh, these wooden structures, uh, chests, they were created in different sizes and wrapped using various metals according to the economic strata of the individual. So you had brass, Pataras, you had silver pataras, you had golden pataras, and uh, the motifs on the pataras, you can see the elephants and the peacocks. So they're the traditional, the flora and fauna that is found in this area of Bhavnagar. And we continue to um, build these pataras on a made to order basis and support the craftsmen. <laughs> Hello, Namaskar. My name is Samyakta. This palace has been my home as well as my workspace for over 30 years now. Uh, this is the courtyard, one of my favorite places. It's very beautiful and um, it has a collection of bird paintings. They were painted by an artist called Soma Raisha. He also tutored my father in law, uncle in law, and my three aunt in laws. Very, very prolific. And um, these are water colors, which are um, extremely um, delicate, beautiful, and uh, treat for the eyes. So um, that was my mother, Harani Samyukta Kumari, who is um, an art lover and um, heritage lover. And I think it was because of her influence that I got interested in the subjects, as I mentioned earlier. She, uh, Somalal Shah, was um, 
an artist based in Bhavnagar for around three decades. And uh, during, he was an alumni of JJ School of Art in Mumbai, and he was patronized by the royal family of Bhavnagar. He went on to being honored with the Ranjit Ram Suvarna Chandra, which is one of the most prestigious awards in Gujarat in 1949. And in um, following which my great grandfather, Maharaja Krishna Kumar Singhji of Bhavnagar, um, commissioned him to, uh, he was commissioned by him to create these bird paintings, which took uh, all of 15 years to be completed because he actually sat and watched in, in order to successfully do justice to these paintings. He sat and watched the birds patiently. Some were native and others migratory in their, new, in their natural habitat through countless seasons. And we have these works that adorn the courtyard of the property. And uh, let me take you along this way. And um, even though... Uh, due to their watercolor nature, they're highly sensitive to light. So as you can see, we have direct sunlight coming in through the courtyard. And uh, to avoid any damage to the paintings, presently we tend to remove them from display during the summer months. And the rest of the time we have a green covering as you would have seen in the start of the video. And this helps um, to protect them from expo excessive exposure to um, the sunlight. We have also now created different uh, memorabilia such as uh, postcards to uh, highlight the artist and these beautiful paintings and they are available at the palace shop that we run for hotel guests and any other locals who are interested. Where um, I can uh, show you the crockery room, it's a collection of um, all the crockery which was crested at the time of the uh, kingdom when there used to be very big banquets and uh, we have kept some of the rare and precious pieces. Most of them were made by Mapple and Webb for the family. So let's have a look at that. So uh, in this room we have gathered some of the crockery from the time of the kingdom. It, it was a center, this was obviously uh, the seat of governance. So it was uh, a center for a lot of people having lunches, dinners, banquets, and it sustained a lot of jobs, a lot of um, you know, uh, visitors, tourists at that time, state, uh, heads of state. And the only way that we thought we could preserve this in a little capsule so that we could showcase it to our tourists is by putting it all together in one room because otherwise it is extremely difficult to maintain these palaces and uh, we always uh, say that these are bottomless pits. However much we put in, it is never enough and maintenance is very, very difficult. But um, this uh, is an easy way out for us. We put everything in one room so that uh, the visitor has a good idea of exactly how um, intricately these banquets were planned and how beautifully they were presented. And uh, this is a little showcase of that. So just as uh, paper with time turns brittle and becomes powder and dust, crockery, as I learned, has a similar uh, impact. Time has a similar impact on crockery. And uh, we realized that the only way to sort of preserve the few remaining timeless pieces was by displaying them in a place. It's an intimate gathering space for dinners and lunches even now and can be privately booked. But uh, it's also a way for us to show a time when um, the property was used by the family for different events and today we have it as we run it as a hotel so it's not entirely possible for us to have these as crockery that is served to guests but at least we are trying to do justice by giving the viewer um, an idea of that time period. Here we uh, are on the first floor of Nilambag and we can see a traditional swing which one would find in most Gujarati households. So here comes the 
local influence and you have this colonial architecture passageway and you have this kachavari swing there which is um, a way for us to blend the colonialism with the indian art and architecture as well Hello and Jai Mata Ji, this is Yuvraj Bhavnagar and welcome to Nilambagh Palace, the Dining Hall. The Darbar Dining Hall and Nilambagh Palace today host to the gourmet traveller a variety of menus. We do give you an opportunity to enjoy the dishes of the Raj, the dishes that were custom made for the Maharajas and the Maharani's of Bhavnagar. Along with that, we keep in mind the taste buds of the local community, of the people of Bhavnagar. Along with that, we firmly believe in a healthy India and a fit India and offer the traveller and the gourmet traveller coming to Bhavnagar a healthy menu as well. So find your menu out here and enjoy and eat as much as you can. So the dining room is used by um, our local guests as well as travellers who come and stay in Nilambar. What uh, one could see the chandeliers, they are uh, made of Czechoslovakian glass and they have been here ever since the property was built. For um, those of you who may not be aware, this type of glass has a long history of being um, internationally recognized for its high quality and craftsmanship and um, is found in um, the Czech Republic even today. Um, the oldest archaeological excavation actually for glass making sites in the Czech Republic dates around to the 1300s. And um, growing up, I've seen the mammoth task of having these chandeliers cleaned and as much as a treat as it is to the eyes it's also a very very daunting experience where one is scared if something will break and um, here we have this uh, piece that was also part of the Burma wood uh, collection that has been fitted in different parts of Nilamba Palace. The elephants that can be seen here have the State, the Bhavnagar State coat of arms uh, carved into them. I will show you here a picture here. And uh, the writing that one can see here says Manushya Yatna Ishwar Kripa, which is the motto of the Bhavnagar State, which states that do your best and leave the rest to God. So here we can see an intricately carved um, elephant and we move forward to some of the works that some of the paintings that have been displayed at the dining room are all um, European in nature. So we have the Thomas Daniel and William Daniel duo uh, paintings here and um, the uh, uncle and nephew duo spent about seven years I think in India uh, traveling around and um, Port, uh, portraying the different landscapes that they witnessed. The Orientalists uh, created some beautiful paintings, some of which have been displayed here. One of them is this, and uh, we have the other one here as well. And uh, we now move to the banquet hall, which is connected to the dining room. The banquet hall is presently used by uh, individuals for events and uh, parties, weddings, conferences, but it's also a place that is used by our family still for uh, festivities. So we have our Diwali annual lunches that happen here as well. And um, we move to where I am seated right now, the library. So even though Nilambag is a private property and it's open to uh, guests as a hotel and for locals, there are certain rooms which are still only for members of the royal family. And this is one of the rooms. It's presently used as an office by all of us. And it houses some of the most interesting books. We have books right from art and history to uh, anthropology and scripture, Hindu scriptures, mythology. So, um, one can read all of this here. We are in the process of digitizing some of these, which would give others access to them. So 
that is one of the projects that we are currently doing. We then come to another room which is um, used often by the family. It's the tea room and um, we use it often for intimate gatherings, for um, lunches, for tea parties. And we... So just to give um, the viewers an idea of what the rooms in Nilambag look like, they are much larger than what one would see in a new modern property. But all the furniture that we uh, have displayed in each of the rooms is part of the old setup. So in a sense, we've tried to create a living museum of some kind with each room, having um, the old furniture, but at the same time, having the modern amenities that any traveler today would require, such as your television, for example, being one of the most important, I think now. And uh, we now move to the swimming pool. So actually the swimming pool that is inspired by the Roman bath style, it uh, wasn't built at the same time as the rest of the structure. So it was built in 1932 and it almost takes us back to a time where leisure as an activity was so integral for the Maharajas or for the royal households. And um, this was built to serve the purpose of uh, leisure for the family. And it is uh, now used as part of the private members health club that we run alongside a gym and a tennis court. And it's also, of course, open to uh, people who come to stay at Nilambag Palace. To continue the leisure um, discussion. We also have a seaside property which um, is used by us as well as is open as a resort and um, it's about an hour and a half away from here and it is also a historic structure. So moving forward, um, we saw the historic significance of Neelam Bagh, but in order to actually maintain it presently, we have a number of activities that we are uh, doing, a number of um, openings such as the Neelam Garden Restaurant. This is um, a local uh, restaurant that caters to the local palate. So we have carefully curated vegetarian meals, which are predominantly what are in demand in Bhavnagar and Gujarat and uh, we have those available here. We have mostly locals who come to dine here and this was of course built much later. We then move on again to the courtyard. Uh, we, when we have um, guests, we organize cultural programs at the courtyard and one of these is the traditional Garba and Dandia dance and here one can see uh, small children from the school that we run doing a performance at the courtyard. The courtyard is also decorated. We continue to decorate it using rangoli and floral patterns till date. And it's a great time when um, the staff of the property come together and actually create these local motives. We had a very interesting time last year when we had a few international visitors and they actually wanted to learn how to create these um, designs and motives. So we used a range of powders and flower petals for the same. And um, we also have these wall hangings displayed in Nilambar Palace. These are created by, uh, this is the local beadwork of the area and what one can see is the Ras Garpa, the Dandia, the traditional dance and originally the beads that were used were not uniform in shape and they were of a larger size and uh, created using glass. Today we use plastic and they are more uniform in size. Now of course we create uh, mobile phone covers and such artifacts to create um, awareness about the craft but also to make it more interesting for the shopper. And uh, this is yet another photograph that's 
a part of the lobby in Nilambar Palace. And we can see um, Maharaja Krishna Kumar Singh Ji with um, the Sid family. And um, he was um, a pioneer in starting the Gir cow breeding, where in the 1940s, he gave 18 Gir cows um, to the Brazilian family, the Sid family. And that's how um, Gir cow breeding actually started in Brazil. And uh, today we continue to uh, have our cattle in our premises. We have about more than 50 cows and all the dairy products that we use in the hotel are is supplied from our own cattle. And this brings me, actually it's a very strange photograph, but it brings me to one of the main issues that we face today, which is maintenance. So, Nilamba Palace is maintained on a yearly, um, we have to maintain it yearly. Here we can see vegetation growing at the top end and we can see some darkening of the stone as well. So uh, these are practices that even though we have this resilient structure, maintaining them is a practice that we have to continue on an annual basis. and. Uh, with the current uh, pandemic that we've all had ourselves stuck in, this has been highly challenging. Um, the summer months, May, June, are when um, we don't have so many people visiting because of the heat in Gujarat. And it's a time when we take on a lot of our maintenance plans. And these have, of course, been put on hold and postponed due to the fact that we couldn't get a lot of labor that could actually come and do maintenance work at the property. And here we have a map of the heritage sites of Bhavnagar. So what we realized is that in order to actually create an interest in Nilamba, we had to give the traveler something more. So we listed out the heritage sites in the city, which gives someone who's coming to Nilamba an actual itinerary for a few days. That what, do, what does one do here? Even if you have leisure tourism, a lot of people looking to come here would want to look at a few different sites. They want to go back home with a memory of visiting a few different historic structures, for example. So this was one of our endeavors. We now have a few heritage walks that we um, have developed, which help people who come to Nilamba Palace to get a better idea of Bhavnagar as a whole, instead of just the property. And uh, here we have the Palitana Jain temples, which are also part of um, any visit to Nilamba Palace, we always recommend going and visiting these Jain temples, which are just about 45 minutes away from us. And uh, we also have the Velavadar Black Park Sanctuary, which is an hour away. So when someone visits Nilamba, they get to experience cultural and natural heritage as we organize these different trips and keep them busy throughout their stay. And here we can see the banquet hall that was once uh, that was shown previously and it is used by students. So we have a lot of activities for the local students of the schools here so that they get to understand the property and the heritage that is also theirs. And they grow up having um, a more rooted, identified background. And here we are in the courtyard again. This was after one of the heritage walks that we organized. And we continue to work with Gujarat tourism in order to make Nilamba Palace a more interesting place for people to come. Uh, we organized an event called the Heritage Interpreter uh, Workshop, which was a certified program for only available for the locals of Bhavnagar, where youngsters were given the opportunity to learn to understand and interpret heritage sites and uh, know what career options they have in this avenue. Here we have a night shot of Nilambak. So although the property is uh, used for a lot of events and weddings, the main problem with historic sites in Gujarat in terms of create, generating an, a revenue is the fact that we are uh, not permitted to serve any alcohol. 
and this ends up being a major problem during weddings that we try to cater to and here this is one of the photographs that was taken before a wedding function and with that i come to the end of my presentation on nilambag palace and um, i hope that you got an idea of what a resilient structure this is and um, the many roles that the property plays in our daily lives um, over to you mimi thank you very much for this fascinating insight into the history and also the people involved in your the important role i think your family members played in the emancipation of women and um, um, all the object that you highlighted. I mean, I, I, I was thrilled to see you have paintings by Dan the Daniels. I mean, it's just wonderful. I really love their, um, their artworks. It's fascinating to have this. Um, before I um, hand it over to um, Sima, uh, for, for the Q&As, and we had some really interesting questions there. And I would like to ask you uh, one important question. And this is something that, you know, anybody who's dealing with historic houses in India is dealing with, namely the question of um, the legacy of the British Raj. I mean, um, you know, I could see so much of East and West, uh, but how would you actually evaluate this, um, you know, this legacy? So, sorry, can you repeat that, Mimi? Um, um, the, the question we are dealing with um, whenever we deal with historic houses in India is uh, uh, the legacy of the British Raj. So, for instance, you know, sometimes this is used as a weapon to basically demolish buildings. I've seen that a lot, you know, because this, these were the colonizers. Why should we actually maintain the buildings and so on? I would, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I would think quite the contrary because um, they have actually contributed to our cultural heritage and it was a part of history that um, where a lot of art and architecture flourished. So to dismiss it wouldn't really be right, but to actually build on it would be the best way forward, I think. And that's what we try and do. We try and give the view visitor who comes to Nilamba Palace a mix of the British Raj as well as what the local art and heritage of Bhavnagar and this region is. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you say this um, because a lot of what I see, um, you know, is sometimes I see is over interpretation and kind of very negative. And I feel some aspects are simply, you know, innovation, a blend between the East and West, which is a very positive thing, especially in architecture and design. And also, you know, uh, pointing the finger is one thing. But how do we move forward? Where do we actually make a good contribution, you know, um, um, in, in, in cultural encounters between nations, between um, different cultures? Um, thank you, uh, Brijeshwari. I'd like to um, now ask Sima to go to the Q&As. And anybody who has more questions, uh, please, you have the chance to do so. If you can't um, handle them all now because of the time, we will um, answer this later. Okay, so we've had a lot of interesting questions coming in. Um, a lot of people are actually curious about the architectural style of the palace. So what can you tell us about that? So it's um, colonial architecture in the sense that we have a minimalist architectural style, I think. But the motifs that adorn Nilamba Palace uh, are uh, local in nature. Their designs are very um, regional. And uh, the architecture as a whole, I would say, is colonial. All right. Um, Victor would not like to know if you receive any state aid for the conservation of the palace. No, it's um, actually a private property. So we do not receive any state aid. I think state aid is limited for structures and sites that are part of the Archaeological Survey of India, if I'm not wrong. Right. Um, and can you tell us more about the seaside resort you mentioned? So uh, about an hour and a half from Nilambag, we have a seaside property. It's called Gopnath Beach Resort. And uh, it was built for the purpose of leisure, as I highlighted. And now we have it open for um, the public as well. So we have a few rooms there that we do give out. And it's a very quaint place because there's not uh, any development there. Unlike Bhavnagar, which is a bustling city, it's um, on the shore and we have a beach there where you will not find a soul. So it's quite blissful. And um, someone wanted to know if the trophies of uh, His Highness Maharaja Bhav Singh Ji are still on display in the palace. 
No, we do not have any trophies of display at the palace. And what do you do for the upkeep of the structure? So maintenance as a whole is something that uh, is done on a daily basis, I think, because uh, to actually have modern amenities in a historic house is quite challenging, right from your fire safety regulations that we, is a mammoth task to actually install fire safety in a building like this. Mm -hmm. And um, you have uh, pipes that you don't know where they start and end at a lot of times. So um, maintenance is something that is done on a daily basis, but we do have a yearly maintenance where we look at things like leakages, painting, um, restoration of the outs outside the facade of Nilambar Palace in order to make it more, um, to highlight it in a way where people want to have events and weddings here. And it's more- The pandemic has had quite the impact on the upkeep. Yes, it has because uh, for the simple reason that May and June are two months where uh, Gujarat does not receive a lot of tourism because of the weather. And uh, this is a time where we take on a lot of restoration projects, maintenance projects, if not big restoration projects. And given the lockdown and the COVID situation, of course, we could not really have any of these um, taken up. So it's been a backlog for us in that sense. And of course, it's been um, a slow time in generating revenues for most hospitality, most people in the hospitality business. So I think that itself has also had a big impact on us. And Rijesh Vari, there's one question from Dr. Vandana, which is very close to my heart, because whenever you try to study these buildings, what can you actually read up on, um, on, on, on Bhavnagar and Nilambar? What is, the, is there any literature that you could recommend for people who are interested in reading more about it? So uh, when I started um, a society here called Bhavnagar Heritage Preservation Society, I realized that even locally there was um, a lot of um, there were a lot of gaps in terms of information, in terms of dates, uh, and uh, to sort of try and fill those gaps, we are presently digitizing a lot of our archives and actually creating a website where one can read and research about the city, about the art, the architecture, the engineering, the historic structures, and of course, the intangible heritage as well. Um, 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 I think Dr. Vandana had a question. She raised her hand. I'm wondering, has it been answered or would you like to um, still say something? Because I think uh, we can actually take some questions. No, it has been answered. Right. Uh, good. So I'd like to announce before we close that um, our next lecture will be next Friday. Um, it will be Aman Nath. We'll be talking about, uh, you know, a, you know a variety, a variety of properties. Um, you know, he is the owner of uh, Nimrana Hotels and, um, you know, between 40 to 50 properties um, from ranging from forts to palaces to various other historic buildings. Um, and also, if you would like to know more about our activities, especially now um, uh, Palace Day on the 19th of July, uh, please contact us. And also, of course, if you follow us on Eventbrite, where you book the event, you will automatically be informed about the new events. Uh, yes, there we have a question. Um, Mr. Paul, can we just um, unmute him, Mr. Mr. Paul? Yeah, um, Onka, could you unmute Mr. Paul, please? Um, if it's not possible, maybe Mr. Paul, you can use the chat option to just write your question. In the meantime, we try to figure it out. Well, Mr. Paul, if you click on the unmute sign now of the yes. microphone, yes. Ah, oh, good. Great. Please. Hello. Welcome. Yes. Uh, I want to ask Vijeshwari. She did not mention the Sihor uh, Palace, which is a treasure uh, of art, old art, and the Darbargad Palace of Avnagar, which is given to the government and now is currently used for offices. I don't know what is the condition of that now. Uh, so the Sihor Palace is presently uh, being maintained and restored by us. We have a landscaping plan there going on currently. And um, it 
part of the structure has been with the archaeological survey of india but uh, thankfully we have permission to uh, sort of maintain it now and uh, we are amidst uh, restoring it although we are not entirely sure what we hope to create out of it or if we want to make a yet another hotel so thank you thank you brijeshwari thank you so right um so i hope you will join us next friday and i hope you will be active also in a participant in palace day and for any other questions please um uh, contact the center maybe someone similar could you just um, share the email address or i just share the email address with all of you before we close um and you know we are just delighted we'd be delighted to hear from you we'd be delighted we'd be delighted to hear about any kind of plans you have for your palace and any kind of heritage activities to really engage the community and the younger generation thank you so much for having me uh, mimi and uh, i hope that i could sort of provide a brief um, glimpse into what is neelambak palace and uh, my reason for actually bringing everyone into all the directors of the property into the um, video and the documentary was to show that a property or a historic structure cannot really be looked after by a individual it requires a lot of different ideas and um, a lot of different hands that actually make something a success so i think that is something that's very important and um, important to highlight so Thank you for that, and thank you for having me as your speaker. On this thank you, Bridget. Bye. So have a lovely weekend, all of you. Bye.